as of today, what you think content is, do you think you're content? No. I don't think many people are because they don't understand what contentment is. They don't understand what true contentment is. And even before I studied on this, and, and of course I stole a little bit from different ministers while they were preaching on this, but um, <laughs> and got inside of a statement of somebody else. But overall, being content, I found out that I actually can be way more content than I am if I knew what content was. And today I want to bring out that a little bit. And I think we have to question ourselves, are we content? And that's what I want to talk about. And I'm going to talk about what not to be content about too and what to be content about. So let's see how it goes. It's going to be in a supernatural flow. I feel if you really want this to be, a Wednesday night service full of healing, this is what I feel in the spirit that it can be that. If you really want it to break through today in the Holy Ghost power, and you, <laughs> Wednesday night was great. It was not enough for me yet. It was not enough for me yet. I want to get drunk in the Spirit again. I want to see people filled with the Spirit again. I want to see the holiness roll. I want it not to be hard to do a miracle. I want it to be easy. When we call on God's power, I want to see the miracle instantly happening. When the word of knowledge comes out, I want people to believe so strongly that as soon as that word of knowledge is released, they're healed. I want more than we have. What about you? I'm thankful for what we had. I'm thankful. It was an amazing night. But I want more amazing because you know what? I'm content, but I'm not satisfied yet. <laughs> I was totally content with the service, but I'm not satisfied. I want more of God. What about you? I want more because I know that he's more than enough for me. I know that he has everything for me, so I want more. I am tired of being content because content is good because it keeps me moving, but being satisfied would be way greater. And to walk into a whole new level because I know God can bring greater than what he does and what we allow him to bring. It's not God is not the problem. It's us. We kind of come into a rut and say, oh boy, I'm just one of those service games. Get over it. It's not one of those service games. As soon as you choose to be a different service, it will be a different service. As soon as we choose that we come with expectations, as soon as we believe again, as soon as we say, God, you are the miracle working God, as soon as we say that you are the God of salvation, as soon as we say, God, you are the God of healing, it's going to change if we start walking in that again. Yeah, we do, but we walk in our mind. We need to start connecting to our spirit. Our imagination has to connect into the power of the Holy Ghost power. And it has to be flowing through. We have to start envisioning of who God really is for us. And we do. I realize that. That's why I said it was, I was content with it. It was great. It was an awesome night. It was an amazing night. I want it more amazing. I want, I want the cloud to be so heavy in here that everybody just enjoys the presence of God. There's no question asked that God is here. I want them to have every person, I want to even come to the point where people are not even trying, they feel the presence of God because they can't argue it no more. I just want it to happen. What about you? I, I'm, that was not part of my notes, but then again, I don't carry notes. I just carry scripture. <laughs> so God is, the, you know, I'm not a teacher, so I, I, I'm so thankful God made me a preacher. Because I can just put scripture down and, he, and then I can just study it and get a revelation about it. And then when I speak, the revelation comes out and then more revelation comes out. I just love it. Of course, you have to prepare. I mean, it took me hours to just get this ready. But I mean, it's just a matter of, God, I didn't get much. He said, I know. <laughs> he keeps me from getting a lot so that he can do a lot. <laughs> you have to understand that we are a vessel of obedience and we choose to walk and God is enough. And I have to believe every time I come up here, he's enough. For me to, I came up here and I say, okay, I went over it again and again. I, every, every chapter I'm starting to get a habit. Every scripture I'm doing, I'm, I listen to the whole chapter on audio Bible beforehand just to make the whole chapter in my head, how it flows and stuff like that. And, and I say, okay, God, this is great, but I know it's going to be greater when I get up because I, don't, I only feel it when I come up here. God is so anointing. God's anointing flows through the vessel when you allow it to be. I love that statement, Pastor Kelly said, I forgot. When you claim Jesus, you're not claiming your situation. You're claiming Jesus, the power. So when I claim Jesus as my life, you, when I say Jesus is my, if I'm, a, I'm born again believer, and I believe that Jesus is the Savior of my life, when I claim to be a Christian, when I claim Jesus Christ in my life, it's nothing to do with my circumstances, it's nothing to do with my ignorance, it's nothing to do with my, my stubbornness and, uh, and everything, trouble that I got, it has nothing to do with me being a, you know what, um, anything. It's nothing to do with that. It's to do that I'm claiming Jesus Christ, the living God. It's nothing to do with me when I claim to be a Christian. It's to do, Jesus has nothing to do with my circumstances. He wants to fix those circumstances when I claim Jesus Christ. And so I love that statement that I heard from you. I don't know exactly how you said it. So 
I'm just kind of saying it in my own words. But the fact is that too many people become hypocrites because they say, well, if that's a Christian, I don't want to be it. You're looking at the wrong thing. Stop looking at human nature. Start looking at God. We can't do that. I mean, we get this every day. Oh, if that's a Christian, I don't want to be it. This guy did that and this guy did that. Of course he did. He's human. What do you expect him to do? He's going to make a lot of mistakes in his life. God is the one that doesn't make mistakes. So when we claim Jesus, it's about Jesus. It's not about my little circumstances that I suffer with. It's not my, my little, maybe every so often slip a swear word out, or I don't, but I'm mean, just giving examples. It's not about that. It's when I claim Jesus, it's about him. It's about him. You know? Don't get, get scared away here right now. I don't swear. I say words that people don't approve of, but I don't swear. <laughs> That's just my grammar, and that's just my style. I say things that I don't think are swear words. Other people say, whoa, you said that in church? Well, yeah, I did. But anyway, let's go forth here. 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 8. 1 Timothy 6, chapter 6, 6 to 8. But godliness with contentment is great gain. I love that word. Godliness with great contentment is great gain. Contentment in this word is this, a perfect condition of life in which no aid and support is needed. Sufficiencies of necessaries, sufficiency of necessities, I can't pronounce this. Necessities, there you go. <laughs> Praise God. I feel like speaking in tongues. <laughs> Get people woken up that way. It's, it's contentment is being in content of the mind and it's lot. And you know what lot means? It's in your purpose. See, the thing is, you can't have contentment if you don't have purpose. You don't know how to be content. You don't even know how where God is enough when you don't live in purpose. You, I just did that message. Was that last Sunday? I don't know when I did that message about uh, purpose and vision. I think it was last Sunday. Yeah, you should listen to it online and then listen to it again, then listen to it again because the fact is, without purpose, you're not content. I mean, would you agree with that? Without life, without a reason to live, without, without Jesus, without that place, you, you know what? We try to make contentment because um, we, we go buy something or we, oh, yeah, I got a credit card so I can do this or I can do this or we can do whatever. We try to find, I mean, not talking about necessities. I'm talking about the, the extra things that we try to do to make ourselves happy, to find contentment. And we get ourselves more in trouble than we ever imagined because we're not content, Right? But the fact is that when you walk in godliness with contentment, you're walking in purpose, and you are content with the lot of your life. You're content with who you are in Christ Jesus. You're content of what you're called to be. How many know that we all know what we're called to be right now? You're called to be the sons and daughters of God. You're called to live for Him. You're called to deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow Him. That's what we're all called today. Vision is something for tomorrow. Called is today. Jesus says in Luke 9, 23, He says, Deny yourself. Pick up the cross and follow me. That's our purpose. How hard is that? Quite hard. It's simple. <laughs> it's not easy. I find it's harder and harder because today's culture, we have way too much going on in our thinking. And then as soon as we come into a church and we start believing for something and, and we start walking together because the strength is within the church and the strength is within the body of Christ. And as soon as we start walking together and people start saying, well, you're religious. No, I'm just, I have a family. I'm not religious. I have a family that loves me and takes care of me. I have a family that holds me, the family that walks with me. That's not religion. That is just being safe, and that is walking in the family of God. But what today's culture says, oh, you're religious, that pastor. Well, yeah, everybody needs a spiritual father. In the family, there's a father. You have to understand the presence of God is in the fullness of what God has called us to be, and it's called in a purpose so we can be in contentment. And godliness, there is contentment, is great gain. There's such a great gain in that. I am so content. You know what? I love every one of you, the ones that are so involved in this ministry, the ones that sacrifice their time and just to make and to see. You know what? People on sound, people on video make people's hearts set free. They are part of the ministry that brings people to healing. You know what? Today, if we don't have technology and if we don't video, if we don't put on Facebook and we don't put on Twitter, we're not going to get the people we need to be bring to salvation or healing. We're just not going to get it. You have to understand today's culture we have to walk with the culture to bring people into the freedom. And look at this ministry that we have, God has created here, and we have created a team, and there's great contentment because there is great gain when we work together in what God has called us in our lot, in our purpose. No, I didn't know I was going to preach half the message on that verse. But anyway, here we go. Verse 7. For we, for we brought nothing into this world, 
So let's just read that verse so it makes sense. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought, brought nothing into this world and certainly can't carry nothing out. See, we're too busy with the things that we are carrying around that we can't carry out and begin with. We're too busy. God wants to bless us with it, but he doesn't want us to concern about it. He wants us to live with it. We need to have some of that stuff, but he doesn't want us to think that we have to make it our God because we can't carry it out. We can't make it our, 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 our situation. Can't be, the, the money can't be our problem solver. We, we, we can't carry that like that. We have to carry it as a blessing, not as a God. And when we walk in the contentment of that, we start seeing the blessing in this, and we're seeing the greatness in it, and we're seeing what God is doing in this. It says, you haven't brought nothing, you certainly won't carry nothing out. So, <laughs> you might not agree with it, but, I mean, you might carry something under the grave if you want to. I mean, put something in your coffin, and you might have it underground, I don't know, but you won't bring it to heaven. It's because God is already creating something defined in the heavens and the new earth. God is creating something great there already. He's creating something more than you can ask for. He's creating every desire, your heart will be fulfilled up there. If you like old furniture, you'll have old furniture up there. I believe that. I, God wants to fulfill your desires of your heart. He wants to... He, he is already taking care of those mansions for you. Everything here is just a byproduct of what God is already has greatness up there. We have to do it. And if you like cars, I'm sure you'll have a great car up there. Who knows? God is going to walk in a place of fulfilling the heart of who you are created to be. And really, sometimes it's not our things that are, the, it's the things behind it that is our great joy. And we have to understand that. Verse, uh, uh, verse 8 says this. He says, Now, you won't take nothing out, but having food and clothing... We will be content with that. Now, that's a pretty straight statement here, and faith talkers would go against me if I don't explain it any further. Because food and clothing, I, in Manitoba, I think you need a house too. But, um, but anyway, I'll, I'll explain it, because food is a greater word. It was translated from, from the Greek, and it was a greater word than just food itself. It's a substance. It's a means of sustaining health of your life. Health or life, meaning that food... Here is not just a food in the natural eating, now, now it's a spiritual thing also. It's a nourishment, it means of maintenance your life. So everything that maintains your life, that's what food entails here in the scripture. Everything that maintains your life. Whatever you walk in, whatever you do, um, your finances, your job, that was, it, it's all created into the word food here. It's also the livelihood of who you are, the li to live, to be excited, to, to enjoy life. That's, it's, it's part of that food and clothing that you, you want. It's also the act, the process of sustaining or the quality of being sustained. So it's not just poor stuff, it's quality stuff. No, everything, the essence, the nourishment, everything you have is quality of God. The fullness of it, the, the livelihood, it's everything you have is quality now. And with clothing, with this, be content with that. And this word content means this. This word content does not mean that's it. That's all you need. It's not saying that. The word contentment is this. To be, can you pronounce that word for me right there? Quickly. Sufficient, there you go. Be sufficient, it's to be enough. It is to be a process of unfailing strength. It is an unfailing strength. It is to be strong. It's to defend and to ward off. Meaning this, this word content is this. It's a place of not saying this is, this is all I need. This is saying, Lord, end this contentment. You're going to give me enough. You're going to give me strength to move forward. You're going to give me a place to sustain. You're going to give me a place to walk in a deeper level. You're going to give me more. So this word content is not just saying, okay, that's enough, but it's saying that the Lord is enough for you. So what is enough in the Lord's eyes? He is the enough. He is all strength. He's all efficiency. I will prove it to you with another scripture. Just wait. I will grab a hold of it in a deeper level. You say, well, that doesn't make sense of what the scripture is saying, but the word content still means that. It means an unfailing strength that you walk in. Meaning that when you're content, is that you don't have everything right. It doesn't mean you have everything yet. It means that you have an unfailing strength to move forward to the greater blessing that God has for you. That's what that is. Unfailing strength. Lord, when, you're, when you live in contentment, you get strength to move forward. When you live in the place of saying, God, thank you for this bread that I had today. Even though that wasn't very tasty today. But when you come into the contentment of it, it gives you an unfailing strength because you're living in thanks now and you're walking forward to the next blessing. See, the thing is that we need to be content where we're at. I need to be content. Lord, thank you for this building. We need to say that as a ministry. Thank you for having a building here because when we are content, then there's an unfailing strength that releases us to go greater places. And then now, now it doesn't mean I have enough, but the Lord is enough for me now. 
I want the Lord to be enough for me. What about you? And when I want to walk in that place, I need to start giving and being content with what God has put in front of me to do. And what you have to do, you have to say, Lord, it's not about me being totally satisfied yet, but I have to be content with this to be able to move forward. Because if you're not content with what you have, you won't use what you have to move forward. You have to move forward in what God has called you to move forward in. It means being content is this. The Lord will defend you when you're content. He will ward off the enemy when you're content. So now it's not about being in stress. Now it's not about being in the, in the place of saying, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. But you say, well, Lord, I know this is not much. I know that my drywall is not fixed there yet. I know the, I need some new lights in here. I know that, Lord, but I'm content. Now it's not about worrying about that. Now it's about being content. So when I'm content, his unfilling strength and everything that comes against me will be warded off so that I can see those things fulfilled that God has to be fulfilled in this place. Now we're walking in contentment. We're walking in a place where God has called us to live in and is enough. But until then, because as soon as I stop, and as soon as I'm, I just recently got a vision. We will share that shortly. I can't share it yet, but I sh about, about ministry here and about this thing. But when we walk in that place, and when I'm ready to share, we'll share it very quickly. But when we are walking in that contentment, now we'll see that vision fulfilled. Because if without a vision, a man perish, so you have to know where you're going. So if you don't know where you're going, you won't be content because you don't know where your purpose is taking you. And so now when you're walking with a goal, and now you're in living in contentment, now what happens is that you can't get blessed when you don't know where you're at. You can't be, huh, I'm not stable here. I don't know where my next building will be. I don't know where our church will be. I know where my church is going to be right now. Praise God. That's what God wants us to do, be content where we're at, and so that we can move us forward where we're at, so we're not worried about finding this or this or that, but to focus on what he's called us to do. Focus on the purpose so the vision can be fulfilled. And that's what contentment is for him to be enough for me. And see, the thing is that absolutely he wants to bless you, but he can't bless you if you're not content. Not knowing that the God, your God is your unfailing strength in every position, every place that you walk in, in every factor you're in. That is your, that's your call. This is one thing we shouldn't be content about, John, 3 John 1, 9-11. You know, 3 John was written, and, and at the end of the book it says, I would like to write you with more, but I can't. I'd rather meet with you. How I many of you know email is not always the greatest way to go? <laughs> if you look at this whole, whole chapter, he says, I, this, I have so much more to say, but I can't write this to you. I have to talk to you. And so, you know what? Communication and fellowship is still always face-to-face. -face. It's still an important thing to have. And so when I read through it and I heard this and said, you know, I'm not going to really preach on that, but you know, it's just so true is that this third John is only one book and the only reason he cut it short is because he didn't want them to mistranslate what he was saying. Because he wanted to go and meet them personally to bless them personally and with the, with the vessel, with the anointing, when the presence of God is on somebody, you'll feel it more than you will over a letter, a letter because it becomes life now when you speak it. So that's how this word chapter ends off. And anyway, let's just read verse 9. Third John. It's really, there is no chapter 1, but that's what my Bible says. 1, verse 9. Um, I wrote to the church, but I, I can't pronounce that name. Anybody can help me say that name? Say it aloud for me. That's it. Dial for cheese. <laughs> dial. We'll call him Dial. We'll call him Dial. I'm not going to try. We're not going to spend time trying to figure that one out. But Dyer, you look it up in yourself, and you can try to pronounce that word yourself. That's a name that is not in my vocabulary. Anyway, I wrote to the church to Dial. And this word Dial, this, the guy's name means this. It means a proud, ignorant Christian. Ignorant. A Christian that was just, think he had it all made. A Christian that was just full, you know, <laughs> sorry, had, had a, he thought he had it all. He thought he was the man. He says, who loves to have the preeminence, which means he likes to, to be first in everything. He walks in this place and he wants to be first in everything. If it's not about him, then it's not about nobody. It's that, you know, how many of you know those kind of people? <laughs> I heard somebody. You know, it's really true that we know these kind of people. And, and these are the people that you need to not be content with. It's not, these people are dangerous in your life. These people are, are places where you have to redraw yourself sometimes from because the contentment of, if you're content with them and they allow, allow you to be a leader that's ignorant and a Christian that is, is just, is in this place that this man is. And among them receives us not. So this he's talking about, I wrote to this church, but this one man, this ignorant Christian, this guy that calls himself a Christian. See, the thing is, he's still a Christian. 
<laughs> but if we would judge him and say, man, I don't want to be a Christian, if I'm like that, that's the kind of guy this guy is. And he goes and says, uh, the, I desire to be first. He desires to be first. He receives us not. So he's saying, this guy just won't receive us. Verse 10 says, why? If I come, I will remember his deeds, which he does. Why? If I come, I will remember the deeds that he does. Meaning this, when we have people in our life that are shysters, if you want to call it that, you've got to look at their fruit, and you have to take those fruit into consideration. You can't be content with somebody that you don't understand or trust completely. It doesn't mean you ignore them, but you can't necessarily trust them. You have to look at this, and you have to walk in this place and, and say, okay. He says, I will remember his deeds, meaning that I will remember all the things he's done and spoken against me about, but I will walk in there. But just listen to this. He um, remembered his deeds, um, patroning against us with malice words. This guy was patroning. This word patroning is this. And other a nonsense talk illy about somebody, pointless talk, <laughs> accusing us for false charges that was made. I've been done that. People t falsely accuse me all the time. Have you? Okay. We've all been falsely accused. This is the kind of Christian there is. How many of you know Christians like that? They pick everything and blame everything and pull everything apart that you do for God. This is what it's saying. So don't be content with that. Just listen. He says, the patriot against with malice means with evil words. Oh, man, God. You mean somebody that can call himself a Christian can speak evil? You know what most people tell me? Uh, he's probably not born again, he, even though he says he is. And you know what? He lived in the community. He was a leader, even, in that place. Now, I, ha I know personally people like this, and they personally come across this way. Neither does himself receive the brothers, and he doesn't receive nobody around him. He thinks he's the only right person. If you don't do it his way, I'm not receiving you. You guys are all, all from the devil. That would be my old good Hutterite friend would say that. You're all from the devil, you know. <laughs> That's what he would, they would say. But this is what he says. He wouldn't uh, himself receive the brothers and forbids them that would. And he casts them out of the church. So as soon as he comes against it, as soon as this guy goes in that place and he does it, he says, you, you just don't belong here no more. So then it's, uh, the word of God says, do not content within this place. If you look at it, it says, content therewith. Do not be content with this. This word content is, that is not enough for you guys. You have more than that. Don't, don't let that be enough for you. Don't let uh, somebody, ignorant Christian, or somebody that just keeps talking against you, somebody that just keeps persecuting, don't let that be your life source. Don't let that be your strength. Don't be content with somebody talking against you. Choose not to let that bother you. Choose to remove yourself from those weaknesses. Choose to remove yourself in those places. Even if you don't physically remove yourself, remove that spiritually from yourself. Because that is going to dry you down, and now you think, that, and you start believing what people are telling you that are not truth. And now you're being content with that, believing that you're nobody. Don't be content with somebody that portrays you like that, or t comes against you like that, or comes in anger against you like that. Don't be content with that in that place. Beloved, verse 11, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that does good is of God. Oh. He that does good is of God, but he that does evil is not seen God, has not seen God. Meaning that there's a lot of people that are called themselves Christians possibly, that don't even see God and they don't know how to do it, so they go according to the letter, not according to the word. They go to the, to the written Bible, they don't go according to the Rhema Bible. They don't go according to the voice of God no more. Doing good brings contentment in your life. So if you want to be content, start doing good to each other. Really, it says here, he that does good is of God. So how many of you want to be of God as a Christian? Okay, you need to start doing good. We all are, thank God. But let's do good. Let's do more good than ever because when we do good for somebody else, a good will come back to you. Now you combine the contentment. I love the way one a Jewish priest says this. I love it. He says, every one of us, when we want to be financially blessed, it's not really about being financially blessed, but it's about money. It's about serving somebody. Meaning that if I do my part and serve, it brings a service to somebody that is in need of that service. 
And when he does it, it becomes, and it just grows from there. Now we serve each other instead of we think we're taking money from each other. So we're actually blessing each other. We'd be having an opportunity to live together. We have an opportunity to serve each other. So I serve this man, and he might pay me a wage. And then he serves back to a different place. Now he might pay a wage or he might receive a wage. And now we're serving each other. And now we find contentment in serving each other. Instead of thinking about a way how to become rich with each, from somebody, we think about how can we serve them, and we become rich because we serve them. We find contentment in what we do. And we're too busy sometimes trying to figure out how to have the big thing happen when we just simply need to serve so the big thing can happen. We need to be content in what we have so that we serve in what we have so that it can become a service to somebody so that it can be blessed to somebody. And now the blessing will come back because when you do good, good comes back to you. And we come into that place, the good. Then we become content when we do good, don't you think? When I do good, when I feel something successful, I feel very content in my heart. Like when I minister to somebody, I see, wow, what a breakthrough through that. Uh, I feel so content. That person feels good too. And now there's a service that, did, that will just add on and add on and add on. So doing good brings contentment. You should write that down. Doing good or doing well, doing, doing something great in your life brings contentment. And I think we have to know that. Everything, because you know what? As a human nature, it's always easy to do something bad. Especially when somebody takes you off. Or anything happens. You just feel like, I could just rather get even with this person. <laughs> You know, God says he's a revenger because he does good to somebody. You're doing good to somebody. It's like putting coals on their head, the Bible says. And it burns them. I know I had this situation in Alberta, and, and this guy just kept on bugging me and bugging me, and I kept doing good and kept doing good. And finally, he, he broke down and cried before me and says, I don't deserve this. Every time he did something bad, I invited him for coffee that day. Well, let's have a chat. Yeah, we should visit something. We should get together somebody. I act like it didn't even happen. And sooner or later, you have to know that th this is like, this is a coolest revenge I ever saw. <laughs> I'm, I'm being honest here. Like, it's good to see somebody be revenge. That's good. Like, they deserve it. But anyway, um, they deserve the goodness. <laughs> but, but at the same time, here, here this guy just can't handle it. And he's getting madder and madder because I'm just keep blessing him, keep blessing him. You know what? I should have quit that job. I should have left that job. I should have done everything where that guy was just just wasn't the guy. And finally, he broke. It took me about four years. Four years of blessing somebody. And now, he speaks highly about me. Oh, the whole place speaks good, great about me because I never, ever let anything negative bother me. Though it bothered in here, and I took it to the Lord, and I took it to my pastor, I took it everywhere else, but to them. <laughs> and so, don't hold it in there. You have to take it into a safe place and deal with it, absolutely. But what happens is I go and talk to this Christian friend and this pastor of mine, and all of a sudden I gain the strength to bless him. And it all started off with a vegetal video. Yeah, it's a, the rumor weed. <laughs> I said, I'm not rumoring no more. I'm going to talk about good about everybody. And you know what? Then it brings contentment to your heart. And now you can be blessed and you create a legacy of greatness that God has created you to be. Amen. So um, 1 Corinthians, here I'm going to prove to you that contentment is not just being happy with where you're at, but it's to move forward with what you have and what, what God has for you. And um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, is living grace brings contentment. Living in the grace of God brings contentment. And grace of God is always the, everything God has. And we, we, we'll, we'll live for our lifetime and still see more of God all the time. Would you agree? So yeah, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 9 says, And he said unto them, my grace is efficient. That word efficient is exact same word, identical word, as a content, identical. The same word. So his grace is efficient for you. His grace brings you to contentment. His grace brings you enough. His grace brings you to the fullness of what God has called you to be. It's the exact same word. His, my grace is efficient for thee. And my strength has made perfect in weakness, is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I rather glorify infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I would ra rather not worry about my infirmities and say, thank God for the glory to His grace that will take me over this thing. Uh, you have to understand that His efficiency is always there. His grace will always move me forward. It means that if I choose to be happy where I'm at, though I'm not always 
grateful and not always thankful for everything, but I choose to be content and say, God, I'm taking with what I have, and I'm choosing to walk in your grace, and I'm going to see your efficiency walk in my weaknesses. How many know being content is hard? It is a weakness of ours. A humanity has a hard time being content. It's a weakness. And so God says, my grace is efficient for you in your weaknesses. And I am enough in that place for you. I am more than enough. I have everything you ever need. I have every dime you need. I have every dollar you need. I have everything you ever, ever need. God, why are you so slow? <laughs> Don't we ask him that? Come on, let's be honest. We're human here. God, I was waiting. I'm waiting. Where are you? And he's efficient. It took me four years to break through to somebody's heart. And when that broke through, it's like it never happened. It was just like he was my best friend. Never, never quit. It's like that's, that's it. The fact is to push through in spite of timing, in spite of what you think it should be, but you push and you walk in purpose every day and you live in contentment every day and you will live it and knowing that the Lord is enough for you, not everything you do is enough. But when you walk in the Lord and when you walk in His presence, that is enough. And with that efficiency, His grace, when you walk in His grace and you extend that grace to somebody else because you know that God gave you the grace to live, you're going to extend the grace to somebody else. If you extend that grace, so I know this guy might be not the guy to talk to always, but I'm going to extend my grace to him in spite of what he's doing to me, in spite of what he's walking in, I'm not just pointing at him, I'm just talking. And, that, and if I extend my grace, extend that grace that God has given, extend it to somebody, and they will experience God's grace, they will change. Or leave. <laughs> either way, they're out of your life, and all, or, or in your life, blessing. Either way, it's a blessing, right? You have to know that God takes care of you when you choose to be content and walk in his presence. My last words for today. Philippians 4, 10 to 11. Living in joy of the Lord brings contentment. We need to start knowing the joy of the Lord in us. And we need to start walking in a greater place. Boy, I have two minutes to do this. Here we go. You know, here I thought I'd be done and early. and Not going to happen. God wants to speak to us. Receiving it? Yep. Ephesians 4, 10. But I rejoice, Paul, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me has flourished again. I like this. Went there when we, okay, this one I took out of King James because it sounds the best out of me, but it's hardest to read though, so you have to bear with me. But I rejoice of the Lord greatly that now at last your care, which means your thought, your, your thinking about me, the, your anxiousness, your anxiety about me, whatever you had about me, your thought about me, your care about me, of me has flourished again. Finally, you believe in me again. Finally, you walk in this again. And this is a way, this is what I see. Uh, we've been in great persecution in the past. And it was public, so I have the right to share it publicly. It was, it was, it was talked about. And when we were in that great persecution, this is, is that I believe with all my heart that people will put their thoughts and they put their care back into it and they will flourish again and know that seed that was planted. And they will find the contentment of God and His power that was released. And it was nothing to do with Pastor George Bratz or Ke Pastor Kelly Friesen. It was to do with them being faithful as a leader and bringing forth the Word of God. And they will come back and they will flourish again because I don't believe seeds die. I believe the fruit gets rotten and then we can replant the seed. But the seeds never die. They will always flourish again. Always flourish again. People never ever have lost hope in their life. There always is hope in their life. And so when you look at this, I can relate with this guy. He says, at last, at last, you're grabbing hold of it again. Thank you, Jesus, that you're grabbing hold of that again. Therein you were also careful, which they were very careful. For many years, watching us closely, watching very carefully of what we said and what we did and everything to make sure that we're of Jesus Christ. And that's okay. I'm glad you did that. But we are of Jesus Christ, and I hope you found that out. But the fact is, people are careful, right? They, they try to be so careful, they don't know how, exactly how to walk about it. About it. And they, uh, they, they don't know how to deal with it. So it takes years sometimes to grab a hold of that seed again. Because now that seed starts flourishing again because what was ever that fruit was there was kind of destroyed during persecution. How do you know persecution destroys the fruit? But it doesn't destroy the seed. It doesn't destroy the seed. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, amen? 
I thank God that even though people's lives might have been destroyed, even though some people might have not felt good, but that seed is coming alive again in people. That contentment of people saying, yes, Jesus is there for my healing again. Yes, that is there. And people grab a hold of that again. I thank God that he is the seed that never dies. When a word comes forth, it won't go void. God is that seed. And I am not that seed. I am just a vessel of that seed. I'm just a fruit of it. So are you. Keep your fruit good. Start chewing it on it before it gets rotten. Start using it. I, got a word, I, I spoke that on the American Glory Night. There are small clips. There's five-minute clips and ten-minute clips that you can watch. And you'll, there's, it's good. It's good stuff God has shown me for that. And next week I'm talking about fruit, and you're not going to want to miss it because God's given me a revelation on, on a whole new level of fruit message. <laughs> It's not fruity at all. Anyway, here we go. And it says there, you flourish again, therein you were so also careful, but you lacked opportunity. So the fact is you lost opportunity during this time. But the fact is, I'm thank God you rise up again. Thank God you come again to his contentment, to his grace again. Grab a hold of it again. All that time you've maybe lost opportunity, but God's going to create new opportunities for you today. He's going to grab new opportunities for you to walk into this. Verse 11, it says, Not I speak in respect of want, for I have learned, I have understood. In whatever state I am, therein to be content. means that, you know what? I'm not talking that I want everything. But I'm content where I am. I've learned to exist and be content. This word here, it says, therewith to be means to, to exist. I am content. To be with exist. To be in the existence of my contentment of God. So his efficiency. So how, why, do, why does this make sense to me? Therefore, that state I am, therewith, I, to be, to exist, and to be content. This word content means this. It's a little different than I want but it means to be significant. There we go. I got it. For one's self, strong enough for processing enough to need aid or support you come and to become the strength you exist and you're strong enough to walk through the persecution you're strong enough to walk through all the times that people come against you you're strong enough and you walk in the fullness of the strength of god and you keep building on it you know what i want to thank everybody right now that persecuted me thank you thank you i became a stronger person than i ever have been I, we built a church and a strong team than, stronger than we ever had. Because we been, walked in the contentment of it and we chose not to quit. We chose that God was our, our enough. We chose in every place of it that God was enough for us. And well, guess what? I became stronger with it. Guess what? We became better people because of it. Guess what? We learned to, to love people more. Guess what? We learned to do everything more. We learned to say words better. We learned how to do We just learned through it. We are a stronger church than we ever have been because of persecutions in our life. And today, persecution is still happening. We're becoming stronger Christians every time persecution comes against us. Because we know that our Lord is enough. We know that God is everything for us. We know His grace is efficient for us. And when we walk in that, we strengthen ourselves and we become more fruitful in everything we walk in. Wouldn't you agree? So God, I thank God that he allows me to exist and be content. I, I am a little crybaby sometimes to God, but I sometimes say, God, I want more. And it's okay to do that, even though as you're content, as you know you're doing the will of God, as you know you're walking, and you know a lot of things is about timing, you know, and you just can't wait, you're impatient, you know. 